Okay, thank you very much for attending the uh, uh, evening session for the uh, Arctic Ocean Special Science Session. Uh, we have uh, five speakers today. And uh, so before we start the talks, uh, just want to put up these uh, three overarching questions or discussion point uh, during the panel discussion after the uh, presentation by the speakers. So the first one is what are the major gaps, knowledge gaps in Arctic Ocean science? Second, what are the capability gaps in observing and modeling the Arctic Ocean? And then the third one is how can U.S. CLIVA help fill or reduce these gaps, whether it's observing, uh, or understanding, or modeling the Arctic Ocean by working closely with the domestic and the international community and the funding agencies. So uh, let's bear this in mind, uh, both the speakers uh, and the audience, and then when the talks uh, presentation are finished, we'll come back to this question for a discussion. Uh, with that in mind, I want to welcome our first speaker, our very own Jamie Morrison, a senior scientist from uh, Polar Science Center in uh, University of Washington. Uh, perhaps I need no more introduction. Uh, Jamie is a very well-known, very well-known polar oceanographer. He is going to give an uh, overview on the uh, Arctic Ocean science. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you very much, and thank you everybody for having me here and giving me a chance to make a pitch for uh, observations in the Arctic Ocean. Um, the uh, I get used to this machine. Um, I'm going to start off. There, hit it harder. I'm going to start off with a, a picture that it's pretty typical for, for people that are talking about the Arctic Ocean or things there, and to start off with a picture of what's the circulation like. And, uh, and so they'll usually point out that a big feature is the Beaufort Gyre, the anticyclonic feature that's down in the Canada Basin, and the transpolar drift. And it's true, those are probably the most dominant uh, circulation features. Uh, but uh, what's gone on in recent years is that many believe that the, the anticyclonic gyre circulation uh, basically uh, characterized by the intensity of the Beaufort gyre has dominated Arctic Ocean circulation in recent years. And this is a picture and this quote is from a report. Uh, a lot of people got together and, and said, yeah, the anticyclonic circulation regime, meaning intensification of the Beaufort Gyre uh, uh, has, in this region for the past 16 years has been intensifying and that there's been a buildup of fresh water in the gyre. And I, I'm going to try and convince you that, that this view is simplistic uh, and, and actually, in my opinion, wrong. Uh, <clears throat> and the view is, is based on basically spatially biased observations, in situ observations, and, and a rather narrow regional index uh, to describe uh, the circulation in the Arctic Ocean. <clears throat> this, is a, an all, this is illustrated by this alternate view. Uh, and this uh, is a figure that comes from 1993. On the left is the, uh, is the salinity relative to the US Russian climatology prior to 1990, uh, about almost uh, 40 years of uh, of Russian hydrographic data went into that. Uh, and then the cruise of the Pargo, a uh, US submarine, went around that track. And you're looking at a, at a curtain plot of color contours of salinity anomaly relative to the Russian atlas. You're looking down from up over Scandinavia down towards uh, the Canada side of the basin. And <clears throat> the Arctic Ocean was long characterized it still is characterized by a front between Pacific-derived water uh, in the upper ocean on the Canada side and on the European side, uh, Atlantic-derived upper ocean water, which is saltier and, uh, and warmer. And uh, that front in days past was roughly aligned with that blue line uh, across the, the, the Omanasop Ridge. And then what we saw in uh, in '93 was that this whole region, basically, it's called the Makarov Basin, between the Lomonosov Ridge and the Alpha Mendeleev Ridge system, had gotten about two parts per thousand more salty in the upper 200 meters. 
And it was a, a very significant cyclonic shift in the orientation of the front that drives the transpolar drift. Not only that, but, but the pattern of change was the same as, as the pattern of change that you'd see if you looked at the, the standard deviation of salinity from that U.S. Russian atlas, and that's shown on the right. But that, that standard deviation is one-fifth the value of the, of the change we saw in 93. So we knew something big had happened, and it involved this cyclonic shift of the main front in the Arctic Ocean. And it, it really was very consistent with, a, with an old idea uh, by Sokolov, uh, in review in 1962, this Russian author had basically done a review, and he said, well, okay, the, this, the regimes of circulation in the Arctic Ocean, are, are, there are two of them. There's, a, there's an anticyclonic regime, which looks a lot like that first slide we showed. It shows a very strong, large Beaufort gyre that fills basically the whole western half of the Arctic Ocean and a transpolar drift. And then there's a cyclonic feature, cyclonic regime, in which that Beaufort gyre is sort of compressed, pushed down into the uh, Mackenzie River area. The, the transpolar drift shifts its axis about 30 degrees. And you get a lot of cyclonic circulation along the Russian side of the Arctic Ocean. <clears throat> and he had an explanation for it. He, he argued that that they see the cyclonic circulation when the strength of the of the uh, Icelandic low overwhelms the uh, the polar high, what we would call the Beaufort high, and the Icelandic low is a is a low he as he describes it a low pressure pattern extending over the ocean from Iceland all the way up to the New Siberian Islands, and so I've drawn that as a red line on the plot on the right, and the the color contours are the sea level pressure anomaly associated with the, e, uh, the AO, the Arctic Oscillation, which is the, is the first EOF of surface atmospheric pressure for the Northern Hemisphere. And so what you see is that the Icelandic low basically is the same thing as the AO. The Icelandic low is strong, the AO is strong. So I think in modern terms, uh, he could be able to say, Sokolov could say, that we go into a cyclonic mode when the AO is high. So what happened to the AO around 1993? This is a plot of winter AO uh, from 1950 all the way to the present day. And it's plotted relative to the average winter AO prior to 1990. <clears throat> That's plotted on the left with standard deviation bars. And on the right, we see uh, that the, the elevation on average has been elevated above what it was prior to 1990. So we've been in a relatively high AO state since 1989, which is, I get it, okay, when AO jumped up to a maximum. And then in 1993, we go out there and we measure uh, this cyclonic shift with the Pargo and I think that's consistent, basically, with Sokolov's old argument. So I've spent uh, a long time now kind of looking for these events where we transition the AO and looking to see if we can find examples somehow which illustrate what the changes in circulation are. The, uh, the next, I, I should say, uh, between 1990 and 19, well, really, till, till about 2003, the AO jumps up and down. You look at this plot. And then about 2003, it's almost back to sort of uh, pre-1990 levels. And then we come to 2007, and the AO jumps up again. And by this time, we've got a lot better observing system than just having one submarine cruise. <clears throat> that was, uh, this is dynamic heights from all the CTD stations we could find in the spring of 2008 during IPY, and when a number of projects making in-situ observations for the Arctic Observing Network were active. So we had quite a few buoys measuring hydrographic profiles, and we had a lot of CTD stations 
in the spring of 2008. And this was the dynamic height pattern that we got. And you can see the Beaufort gyre. Uh, you can see the transpolar drift. Beaufort gyre is the red elevated dynamic height uh, surface. And then uh, the Beaufort, uh, excuse me, the transpolar drifts illustrated by the, the strong gradient or front uh, that you see illustrated by that white arrow. And again, it's, it's still pretty much oriented in the cyclonically shifted mode. And the other thing that we found that was surprising based on uh, water chemistry was that while well, everybody had anticipated that, that this freshening of the Beaufort gyre, which, which elevates the dynamic height and spins up the, the circulation, uh, that it was due to ice melt that had all been ecked and pumped into the center of the gyre. But the hydrochemistry found that the source of the fresh water in, in most of the upper part of the, of the uh, Beaufort gyre was associated with Eurasian runoff, runoff. And so the question, this begs the question, how does that runoff get there? Because the big rivers are, are far to the west out in the, out in the Ob and the NSC River region. And uh, so how does it get there? Well, fortunately, we also had ISAT uh, dynamic topography. So this is a plot of ISAT dynamic topography. You see that it looks very much like the Beaufort, uh, excuse me, very much like the dynamic height uh, over the region where we had hydrographic stations. But what it adds is, is a cyclonic circulation that's similar to the ideas of Sokolov that's on the Russian side of the Arctic Ocean. And that, that, uh, that trough of, of low pressure on the Russian side uh, creates a cyclonic circulation. And perhaps more importantly, it uh, is the path for this Eurasian runoff to, uh, to make it all the way over to the Canada Basin. This is a quick go through this. Here we looked at the same period, 2005 to 2008. This is the trend in dynamic topography. Can you see the increase in height in the Beaufort gyre? But you can also see a development or a strengthening of that trough on the Russian, Russian side. Uh, I'll have to go into it later with a little what those triangles are, but but that's those triangles basically indicate that we can use race bottom pressure and dynamic topography from altimetry to estimate uh, freshwater content of the Arctic Ocean. And I'm going to speed through here. Okay, so we got the big jump in 2007. It was associated with this developing trough on the Russian side of the Arctic and looks like the cyclonic circulation pattern. And then we have a, the opposite thing happen in 2010. 2009, the AO was 0.78, or excuse me, 0.76. And then, uh, so what we've plotted here is the average DOT from uh, ISAP in the Arctic Ocean, and you can see, and the subarctic seas, and you can see that there was this, still this trough, this low saddle over on the Russian side of the Arctic Ocean with, with good along, along coast uh, circulation along the Russian coast. So then in 2010, we don't have any, unfortunately, we didn't have any altimetry at that time, but the AO reached this record minimum. And then we can look at the, the average cryostat DOT from 2011 to 2015 on the right, and you can see that 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 trough is filled in. So when, when we now had a negative excursion, AO dropped, we basically fill in that trough. And this looks a lot more like the classic uh, Sokolov anticyclonic mode of circulation. And OK, so we've had, we've had 30 years of this positive AO basically one standard deviation above what the AO was prior to 1990. And particularly since 2014, we've had a positive AO. So what's the outcome now? What the, 
what the things look like. Well, this is the uh, dynamic ocean topography from April, uh, excuse me, from December 2018 to April 2019. These are monthly dynamic topographies from ISAT, and they're actually relative to the mean, excuse me, it's not the DOT, it's the sea surface height anomaly relative to the average cryosat um, mean sea surface. This is from, we're from Ron Kwok. <clears throat> and what we see is there is a little uh, boost in the southern Beaufort, a little rise, but the dominant feature of these plots is a, is a 20, meter, 20 centimeter drop over the Russian basin that's, that's part of the cyclonic circulation. So to me, this implies that this last winter, we had, we had cyclonic circulation, the cyclonic regime. <clears throat> and us, after three decades of elevated AO, how's our in situ observing system? And I think this is maybe the most important thing for this, uh, for this talk. How well does that observing system capture this cyclonic feature, this trough that's on the Russian side of the Arctic, it doesn't really capture it at all. Uh, what you see here are plots from Ignatius Rigor, uh, the, excuse me, the International Arctic Buoy Program surface drifters are the little black lines, and they measure surface atmospheric pressure and temperature. The only hydrographic profiles really come from uh, six ice tethered profilers uh, these are CTDs that are automated, they drift with the ice, and they're capable of measuring dynamic height. So they, they can give you a dynamic height. We also have uh, some sections that hadn't happened. This was in March 2019. There are some surveys that will go on here in the summer and in Bering Strait and in the Beaufort Sea. But what you see is that there are no measurements in situ of hydrography in the whole Russian side of the Arctic. And this is, this is a degradation of the, of the observing system that's kind of occurred over the last five or six years. And basically, uh, this 2018 to 19 uh, event, we're blind to it. If it weren't for ISAT uh, and cryostat, we wouldn't know that it was going on. Okay, why does that matter? Well, there are a bunch of reasons, and I'm gonna jump to one since time is short. I think the most important reason that cyclonic mode is important to understand, it's important to know when it occurs, is because it does send this Eurasian runoff over to the Beaufort Sea. And, and what that does is it starves the cold halocline layer of fresh water, and that basically weakens this cold halocline layer. And I have to explain, in most of the, Eastern Arctic, there's warm water at depth. Uh, it just comes in with the Atlantic water, sinks below this cold halocline. The, the density stratification at the bottom of the mixed layer is high. It's up uh, only 30 meters below the surface. And, but the, the thermocline is lower. And what's in between is a cold but relatively fresh layer that basically blocks heat from getting from the Atlantic water all the way to the ice. So how does that water get fresh? Well, the existing theory is that it's Eurasian runoff that comes out off the shelf and mixes in at sort of mid-depth in the, in the upper ocean. And basically it creates this insulating layer. So probably the climatically most important feature of the cyclonic mode is it will tend to weaken that layer and and melt, allow, excuse me, allow Atlantic water to melt uh, the ice from below. And I've got some other things, but I'm going to speed along. And I'm going to cover. Uh, relative use of. Uh, uh, let's see. When did I want to? Oh, the answers. <laughs> I think there's so many causes for this absence of observation. One, there's just a, got to develop a cooperative 
relationship with, with Russia, basically. And, and then the other aspects are that it's hard to get there. That's kind of a long way from anywhere. Uh It's important to, to have basically the commitment to say, okay, we're going to go out and make these measurements and we're going to do whatever it takes to make them. It's significant that the Soviet Union had these programs called SEVER, or the SEVER Arctic Airborne Surveys, which they'd go out every year with a small airplane that they would land on the ice and they would do CTD or water or bottle cast all over the basin. And it was an amazing effort because it was so focused and they basically every year they would try and get a map of hydrography so that they could come up with explanations like Sokolov did. And uh, I mean, they did that starting in 1950. And it seems to me that with all the technology we have now, uh, what it really takes is the commitment. Somebody to say, okay, we're just gonna go out there and make sure that we track uh, upper ocean salinity, temperature, make hydrographic measurements. And, uh, and that's really it. It's, it's the will, it's not really the way. If you have the will, this can be done. So, so Jimmy, you, you mentioned the water chemistry was used to uh, look at water source, fresh water source. Yes. Uh, so is that continuing, that kind of water chemistry measurement? Well, that's the one thing that we can't do with the satellite. Yeah. Uh, no, we have had trouble doing that. We had a we had a project called the North Pole Environmental Group, and we made chemistry as a part of that. So we did fly around. We kind of modeled it after what the Russians did. Fly around, see a quick plane, and land on the ice, do hydrographic profile, and collect water samples. And Matt Altire, who was one of the total contributors to this, uh, was our chemist. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Uh, yeah, our North Pole Environmental Observatory project used to do that. We had uh, a chemist on board and we'd fly out with small aircraft and land on the ice and do hydrographic sections. And we, we focused on actually trying to make a hydrographic section across the transpolar drift. Uh, it's kind of oceanography 101 that if you have fronts, you want to sample across fronts rather than along fronts. And that was my, I mean, I love buoys that drift around and give you measurements. They're certainly better than no measurements at all. But in terms of doing hydrography, they're limited because they tend to drift with the upper ocean current. And so you tend to get sections that are really along front rather than across front. So each, that our program and then the, the NABOS program was a Nansen and Amundsen Basin uh, observing system actually had moorings over on the Russian side of the Arctic Ocean. And then we'd try and match up our sections, their sections to get this sort of trans-Arctic section that was long 90 east, 90 west. There's also the switchyard program that did the, did the uh, Canada side. Thank you. Uh, Amy? I agree, it's a real challenge uh, getting measurements in the Russian section, but there have been these Russian drifting stations since the 40s. It's a huge amount of data, and I don't know if that will really address the questions that you're asking, but have um, you or the people that you're working with been using the Russian drifting station data? Well, the, <clears throat> the Russian uh, climatology that I was talking about used all the Russian drifting station data plus these SEVER surveys, plus, plus uh, U.S. data. It was part of the gore chernomirden agreement, and along with these submarine cruises, uh, uh, was really a, a byproduct of the end of the Cold War. And so the gore chernomirden boy, gore chernomirden agreement was to share data that had formerly been classified like this Russian data and some data that we'd collected with ONR and, and uh, pool those, and then this, this atlas is developed. So yes, the, 
the uh, Russian ice station data is is in that hydrographic app. If I could have a follow-up comment on that, the uh, director of the Russian National Ocean Data Center told me that uh, they would love to share the data, but when I actually asked for the data, I wanted the data during the satellite period for validation. They said they are discontinued. So after the Cold War, they gradually phased down, and now a lot of measurement, they don't even continue anymore. So, yeah. Yeah, right. It was sort of a... It was sort of a big dip. The 90s are kind of the, almost the most sparse data patch uh, because theirs had fallen off and ours hadn't spun up, really. Okay. Uh, if you have more questions, we could uh, continue with that in the discussion period. So thank you very much, Jamie. Uh, so we move on to the next talk. Uh, by Sandy Starweather from NOAA Earth System uh, Research Lab. Uh, Sandy is also the director of the US Arctic uh, Observing Network. And she also, uh, and also the vice chair for the Sustaining Arctic uh, Observing Network, uh, Scion. And she also uh, co lead the white paper with Craig Lee, uh, the community white paper uh, for Ocean Up 19 that has come out already, so look out for that paper. Thank you, Sandy, for making the remote presentation. Andy? Thank you, Tony. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. Um, yeah, for, thanks for uh, inviting us to, to um, this discussion. And I apologize that Craig and I lead the discussion because this is really, uh, an oceanography topic, and and I have to confess, I am not an oceanographer. Um, my expertise is really in the the organizational methodological approaches of observing networks, um, and the the ability to uh, um, these kinds of thoughts towards the the Arctic observing system um, is really a compelling problem. What I'm going to talk about today is how how we chose um, or how we propose to address this grand challenge, um, and I'll give samples or, or one example in particular uh, uh, to help create how this might work. And and I'll I'll thank Craig for the slides that included. So for the next slide, and I think you're doing slides for me. There we go. So a little bit of a talk outline. I'll present the vision. Um, for what we're calling the Arctic Regional Component of the Global Ocean Observing System, uh, or ARC Goose, um, and follow that with some of the, the development strategy, both methodological and organizational. Um, and Craig provided a, a really nice example of, a, of an observing gap that also echoes some of what we just described um, in terms of a spatially biased point of view uh, and our, our failure example um, in really uh, critical events such as such as the Eurasian Basin. And then I'll, I'll wrap that up with some uh, idea of what we think will be the next for um, this arc, which was the the pulling together of this scheme of authors was really inside the Ocean Ops meeting, a 2019 meeting that's going to be in Honolulu next month. Um, it'll be a very new initiative, and we're trying to just get feedback from other groups. So it's really a nice opportunity to talk to Clark um, at, at this time. So on the next slide, the what is the vision for um, for the Argus? Uh, certainly decadal scale observation and understanding that we need to be looking at a uh, that we need to be looking at the coupled Arctic system. Um, as an Arctic based uh, initiative, we of course have to very strongly take into consideration um, the role that community based monitoring might be able to play, especially in uh, in the in the sh shelves near shore region where there's a lot of human activity uh, that that we could take advantage of, but also 
uh, the more kind of traditional sensor-based observations for the for the, for the deeper parts and and the basins. Um, we are certainly looking at uh, time scales that are going to support planning and decision making, um, as well as things that are going to be more in uh, in an operational um, or even near real time uh, type of of capacity. So we're really looking across a critical point I think that was made in this discussion paper was the need to really carefully think about time scales and how we would propose to uh, to develop a system. On the next page, uh, we talk about the sort of grand challenge, which is that in order to think about a multi-purpose observing system that's going to be able to address both the more scientifically oriented questions, the more climate scale questions, and the more operational scale questions, a system where we observe once and, and use observations multiple times, we are going to need, of course, the cooperation of a broad range of experts, and we need to think about uh, cosine. And so, given the um, the complexity of developing requirements for an observing system, um, we really need to about how we how we draw in the right key of people to develop uh, a consensus view about what those requirements might be. This ultimately to address some of those uh, that Jamie raised in the last presentation really to age the commitments from fund organizations to um, to participate in supporting a system like this. They really need to seek consensus views of requirements. And so we spent a lot of time in this paper thinking about what the structure of consensus view requirements might look like. On the next slide, um, oh, sorry. there and, and so the two points in the paper and, and that I'm emphasizing this presentation um, is, is that you need a framework to address the, this complexity. The framework has to both talk about um, methodological issues, how you assess uh, the impact of different types of observations, um, but it also has to talk about uh, how organizations are, are going to participate um, in, in making this come together. So, uh, so the next two points I'm going to talk about are some of the logical uh, considerations that the ARC Goose is, is going to be operating under, but also organizational. So on the next slide, um, what we looked to, uh, oh, sorry, and I think I said this, but, um, but I'll give you a second to read it. So, so on the next slide, um, I'll start with the methodological considerations. Um, the organization that I'm leading, the U.S. Arctic Observing Network, uh, is is organized into some pilot tasks, and one of the leading tasks was um, concerned with uh, with improve with with improving uh, the observational capacity to support sea ice forecasting. So, looking at the window um, being anything from six hours to uh, out to uh, uh, two weeks, um, maybe up to a month. So we're looking at really uh, kind of quasi real time and observations that are the most um, impact. Uh, to achieve this ob objective, we identified, and if you click next, I'll show you um, three um, steps that we identified. First, we really need to understand if we're going to improve sea ice forecasting, who the user base is for the forecasting, and what their needs are. So that's the self-evident one in the requirements gathering process. You have to start with your user base. Next, you need to, uh, there you are, uh, because we have a lot of existing observations, we need to make sure that we're maximally exploiting the existing observations. And then lastly, we need to have an opportunity to look down the road, improve this for the future observing system. And this includes identifying key gaps and needs. And then, as I said before, developing a consensus view um, of what the requirements for the system are. 
So if you click ahead one um, and think about the user base for the CI forecasting observing system, uh, a key to, a key resource that we turn to in order to make sure that the that the um, system is responsive to Arctic needs was the idea of using societal benefit areas as a means to assess how well the observing system has been, is doing. Um, what I'm showing here are the results of shop from 2016. That was, uh, that was a deliverable for the first Arctic science material, a gathering of 25 science ministers from around the world uh, with um, Arctic research issues. And uh, they funded, uh, the U.S. funded as a deliverable the science ministerial, um, this framework uh, to support assessments um, such as what we're talking about for, for the ARC goose. Um, I list here the 12 societal benefit areas that sit at the top um, of this assessment framework. These are supported by a couple dozen sub areas and 100 key objectives. The idea is to use these um, areas and objectives to help understand whether you're maximizing the user base for your observations, where the highest act observations lie, um, and then to, to focus on those as you're developing requirements moving forward. So in slide, I show that in the context of the sea ice forecasting problem, uh, how we chose to proceed, uh, and I think we need to get to the next slide, or maybe there's a lag. Okay, here we go. Um, so what we proposed to do is to develop a value tree assessment where we could link starting at the observing system, be it space-borne, um, surface, airborne, human observers, through the value-added product streams, through the models that use these products into the applications, how those applications are supporting societal benefit areas. So this is a little bit of a methodological uh, concept to help you assess which observations are going to be the highest. Effect. The next slide show you an example is an example um, of how we executed the sea ice forecasting problem. The box in red is a good to focus because we chose one daily analysis from the Alaska Ice Program um, to organize this. What you'll see is that analysis itself is supported by several models, which are in turn supported by these data products. And it works, it helps us work all the way back to the observing system, understand the downstream upstream dependencies of these different products and services, um, assess the criticality of different systems in supporting these outcomes. So this kind of assessment methodology helps, helps get you focused on what your current observing system is doing for you. It can also help you focus on gaps. So if we did, uh, one more. So in, in the concept of the Arctic, the Arcus um, effort, we took this methodology. Uh, and so what you'll see in that center area is an example. Um, the, the lead authors did a, a, did a, a trial assessment where um, in order to develop an Arcus, which we've already declared needs to address planning, strategic and tactical um, scales. How do we see those scales of observation relating into these societal benefit areas like disaster mitigation, but also fundamental understanding of the Arctic system um, and understanding uh, things like weather forecasting and climate projections, uh, uh, as well as, as different kinds of marine processes, and then how does this, um, how do these sub areas help inform those aspects of something like the essential variables of the global ocean observing system, which you see on the right, that should really be driving the focus for the exercise. Um, and so, so here we say that we're relating Arctic value global variables, uh, what the Argus process re recognizes that it needs in terms of 
coordination with the global global networks is both to um, is both to uh, show which of the global variables are going to be of most impact in the Arctic and also to uh, demonstrate where Arctic specific requirements are gonna drive uh, the technologies for observing into different directions. So what we propose to do through Argus is to extend the definitions of um, essential variable Arctic, focusing both on those which will be the highest impact and, uh, and then focusing the requirement process on, on Arctic specific missions. Um, so next slide, uh, talking just very briefly about the organizational. Uh, so on the organizational leadership side, um, these are some examples of of the partners that we would like to draw together. Um, and it's very interesting to be uh, represented at this Clivar discussion to better understand um, what Clivar's role might be. On the next slide. Uh, just to briefly show that Seon is seeking to play the role of a regional facilitator uh, for this process. There are many other aspects of the Arctic system, um, Arctic, terrestrial, uh, um, and community-based observing cryospheric that Seon is, is seeking to facilitate into more of a synthetic observing network. Um, of which this uh, ocean component is certainly quite important, it's not quite on the map yet, because um, it's initiative. On the next slide, um, of course, we're recognizing our relationship with uh, Goose, as I mentioned before. Uh, the example I just gave for sea ice is just one of the many uh, ocean variables that the Global Ocean Observing System concerns itself with, and um, and we are we are networking through their regional association to bring this process forward. So on the next slide, and I'll have to move very quickly as I am up to an end. I'm going to show a few of Craig's examples um, about this arc. Arctic Argo uh, gap example. And so Argo is a technology that's used into the Global Ocean Observing System. Uh, 400 Argos, I believe, are deployed at any given time doing uh, temperature and salinity profiles in the, in the ocean. And what this uh, example here has done is it's compared a similarly sized um, area of ocean in the Arabian Arctic. Uh, and what they've compared is not just the um, not just the number of profiles. And so I'm sorry, what we're comparing here are Argos with ice tethered profilers, those same profilers that Jamie described um, in the last example. And and so while you're getting a similar number of profiles, there's clearly a spatial bias. Um, in the Arctic of, of where these profilers are able to sample compared to the sense of coverage that you get out of Argo sampling. Um, on the following slide, uh, what you can see is this feasible study that was um, conducted by the authors listed at the top. Um, it was, it was a, a, a model-based experiment where they looked, if you look in the upper right, the long blue line and a small red line, and they um, did a synthetic study where they looked at a, a long drift or narrow area drift in red, um, theoretical drift of two different Argo boats. And, uh, and they proposed that if they could only come up through, so one of the limitations of Argo in the Arctic, of course, is the sea ice coverage. They need GPS and iridium in order to, uh, to geolocate and provide information. And so one question was that if these Argo floats could only um, come to the surface and transmit information through leads or uh, lower ice fraction areas, um, would they still be efficacious? And th the study um, results without completely unpacking them um, certainly found that there's some potential to be able to do this. And it, it prompts the question, do we need a more Arctic-specific technology and solutions? 
So I think we can just briefly look at the next slide. I won't speak to it in the interest of time. Um, it is it is more, and I think these will be available uh, after this meeting, looking at different water fraction thresholds that enable this type of approach. This example both speaks to gap in the Arctic observing system, a really important gap in the Arctic observing system. But also, um, it also suggests how a community-based effort to identify best technologies for addressing the issue to be supported by these kinds of um, scientific endeavors and also certainly um, observing system experiments, which are also highlighted in the, the paper, in the Ocean Ops paper. So I think I just have one or two slides that we can zip through. Um, not seeing the next one yet. Okay, so next for Arcus is, um, Certainly, as I said, this is a new effort, and it's it's great timing for us to input from other organizations and communities, um, and really to enlist more expertise uh, because this is going to be a multi-expert um, problem. Um, Craig couldn't be with us because he is at the Goose Regional Association meeting in Japan right now, um, trying to make progress on this cross-organizational leadership plan. Um, though that one of the most pressing issues is to really, um, expand input from observed system experiments, um, anticipating that some type of workshop in order to help really platform this effort most successfully. Um, and so the, the, the tech mission for more um, follow-up questions on this material. And again, I apologize that neither of us could be there in person, um, but certainly we're, we're keen to hear uh, Clivar's feedback on these opportunities and to understand how you might wanna partner with us. So if you wanna just leave it on the last slide, that's our, our contact, on, on the next slide, that's our contact information. Thank you very much, Sandy. Question for Cindy. Hi, this, thank you very much for a nice talk. This is Alison McDonald from Hui. Um, so I'm wondering with that um, that picture of you know, a possible Argo uh, deployment, given Jamie's uh, slides, which showed a complete lack of anything in those Russian waters, how would one go about deploying Argo floats there? And how would one keep them there? Because they would just flow out with the drift, wouldn't they? Correct. You know, again, it, uh, a little out of my subject matter expertise, but but we do know that from the Bluey program, uh, deployment into Russia is one of the chief hindrances, and that even when things are successfully deployed in the Ru Russian sector, really quickly drift away. Um, so, and and it's an increasingly difficult to ice tethered profilers. Um, uh, no, no clear answers at this time. Um, I think we are are hoping that uh, that we could enlist some um, you know, through the uh, through the International Ocean uh, the IOC uh, committee um, that it, that can be a successful place to um, engage uh, U.S. and Russian conversations on on joint interests, um, but it, it, it is a, it is a, it is a, a, a key difficulty right now, for sure. Uh, this is Tony, Sandy. I want to add to that that uh, there is also the uh, difficulty of uh, ITAR control for certain instruments, glider maybe, perhaps other as well. So I am curious how the governance of the Arctic goose will look like, given that the geopolitical issue. Do you have any insight yeah. on how that can be managed? So again, I think I think when geopolitical issues are heightened, organizations like the World Meteorological Organization and the IOC tend to be safe havens for cooperation. And it's and and I think it's 
it's more critical than ever to um, be aligned. So as an Arctic regional activity, there's a lot of facilitation um, that can be accomplished, but I think the global organizations just have a, a very longstanding um, role in, in helping with this kind of facilitation. And so it's really to, to be seen. Um, and I think we just need to, need to try to work through a strategy like on, on engaging on those issues. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Sandy. Uh, we will have a discussion period later. And uh, just also for information that uh, uh, there will be a panel discussion tomorrow morning uh, on Arctic Ocean Observing System as well. Uh, so thank you. Let's thank Sandy again. So we move on to the next talk. Uh, Tom Armitage from JPL, scientist from JPL. We talk about the satellite observing system. So at least the satellite can see the Russian side. And uh, Tom, Tom is a uh, 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 expert in uh, uh, well known in the altimetry community for uh, high latitude altimetry. So if you ever look at the Arctic Ocean uh, altimetry product, a Southern Ocean altimetry product, chances are it's produced by him. So. Hi everyone. Good evening. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm Tom Armitage. I'm at the Jet Propulsion Lab, um, and I'm going to talk about satellite observations in the Arctic. Um, I like to show this picture because it just illustrates that ever since we went to space, this is from Apollo 8, we've been looking back at the Earth, and so remote sensing has been happening for a very long time, um, and it's really curiosity-driven. Um, it was also developed because of the Cold War. You know, like Jamie's stuff was all uh, a Cold War competition. So was satellite of Earth observation. Um, so, you know, quite inter interesting parallels there. This is just a picture of NASA's current um, Earth observation fleet. So this is the operational satellites that we have in orbit looking at the Earth. Um, this doesn't include planned missions. Um, and it doesn't include missions of our partners in the, in the Navy and NOAA and uh, internationally. So you can, you know, double that at least uh, for the number of satellites that we have looking at Earth. So there's never been a better time to be, do it, to be looking at the data. There's so much of it. Um, to go with at the moment. Um, I was told there would be wet oceanographers here, so I just do a quick kind of um, principles of remote sensing. I'm sure most people know about this stuff, but the atmosphere is pretty much opaque across much of the spectrum. But there's these like nice gaps where we can see from space right down to the surface of the Earth, in particularly obviously in the visible uh, range, but also this big gap in the uh, microwave and radio uh, range, which we use a lot. We use a lot, uh, microwaves a lot in, in a remote sensing. Um, there's two principal types of system uh, that we put in space. So there's active systems where you emit some energy towards the Earth. It reflects back and you record the, the signal that you get. And there's passive systems which actually just record the, uh, the emissions from the Earth across various different wavelengths. So an, an obvious example of that is visible imagery. If you go to the space station and take a picture of the Earth with a camera, that's just visible imagery remote sensing. Um, I think actually uh, the, the kind of previous two talks really set this slide up nicely. I would say remote sensing is really essential for our understanding of, of the polar regions in the Arctic Ocean, uh, probably more so for the Southern Ocean even considering how isolated that place is. But um, obviously it's a harsh climate. Um, it's expensive to operate there. It's expensive to go there. And the equipment that you have to buy to deploy there is very expensive. So that's why <laughs> principally there's not very many observations there. Um, so in that sense, remote sensing has a very high value added for Arctic science, um, just because it gives us that extensive coverage with frequent repeat times year round, um, that these, these scales that are relevant for uh, global climate models, for weather prediction um, and climate change um, that we can't get from in situ observations necessarily. Um, obviously that, that coverage and repeat time comes at the cost of resolution. So we're looking at things on kilometer, tens of kilometers, hundreds of kilometer scales. Um, whereas obviously in situ data gives us those point measurements, highly detailed, very precise measurements that are more suited for looking at uh, the physics of the system and the, the mechanics and interaction that are going on. Um, so in that sense, remote sensing is, isn't in competition with this in situ data, it's highly complementary to that in situ data. 
And the other thing that you have to bear in mind, that obviously, with remote sensing, is you're not measuring the, the quantity of interest. You're measuring something else. So, for example, we don't measure ice concentration from space. We measure uh, emissions of microwave radiation and use some model to link that to ice concentration. And in that sense as well, in situ data is always going to be essential for evaluating these, these measurements. Um, so with that all said, I'm just going to give you a whistle stop tour through what we can look at from space uh, in the Arctic. So first, remote sensing of sea ice. Um, probably did the most well-known and, and best uh, record of uh, satellite observations that we have in the Arctic comes from passive microwave observations. Um, this just illustrates on the left, this was from yesterday. This is the daily coverage of satellite uh, microwave emissions from the Arctic and Southern Ocean. And it's just to illustrate that basically sea ice is very high contrast with the open ocean. It's very easy to see where the sea ice is. And we have this record going back to um, 1978, daily observations of uh, sea ice coverage. And it's probably uh, one of, if not the most important climate data sets that we have. Um, contemporary data sets that we have. This is this is a sort of summary of the, those data for the Arctic. Each line is a month, uh, and then it's every year for every month, um, going from the late 70s to, to the present uh, to, to the present day. So September and March, which is roughly the minimum and maximum uh, sea ice cover. And obviously, over that time, it's well known that uh, Arctic sea ice has declined by uh, almost half in the summer. And so we really see the imprint of climate change in these data sets in the Arctic. Um, we've seen the emergence of this Arctic amplification signal. Um, other cool things that we can do with this passive microwave imagery, but also with active radar instruments, uh, is that we can um, look at these images and sequential uh, takes of the same area and do a cross-correlation analysis and look at the motion of the sea ice over time. Um, and this is a, an animation of sea ice motion. This is for the year 2003, daily sea ice motion. It's not a static thing at all, and it, it kind of basically just blows around with the wind. You can probably see like individual storms crossing across the Arctic from the, from the Icelandic, the, the, those Icelandic lows that Jamie was talking about. Um, what we've seen from this data set is the Arctic sea ice has weakened and sped up over the, over the record uh, in response to thinning. By tracking the, the parcels of sea ice, you can label them and give them an age. So over time, we've been able to track the age of sea ice. Uh, this uh, graphic from NOAA just shows on the left at the top, uh, the red stuff is, is ice that's five or more years old uh, in 1985 and 2016. And you can see that over that period, we've lost nearly all of the old, thick, resilient sea ice in the Arctic Ocean. And it's now predominantly a, a seasonal ice pack where it was once a perennial ice pack. Um, as well as measuring the coverage of sea ice, we want to be able to uh, think about the thickness of the sea ice. So um, that's an important um, variable for climate because it really it gives you an indication of um, the total volume of freshwater locked in that ice, uh, the amount of heat and freshwater uh, that it takes to make that much ice. Um, and also the thickness determines the ice strength. So if the ice is getting weaker over time, that's going to be reflected uh, by changes in thickness. And there's two measurement techniques that we can use for looking at the ice thickness. The first is altimetry, um, where you infer the thickness of the full uh, ice layer by looking at the freeboard. And the freeboard is simply the amount that the ice sticks up out of the water uh, relative to local sea level. So you then just convert it using uh, Archimedes principle to get the, the full thickness. And the other one is using uh, certain types of passive microwave emissions that are sensitive to the thickness of uh, thin ice in particular, so the amount of uh, radiation basically that's coming through that ice from the ocean. Um, good thing about these two different observations is they're complementary. So this uh, graphic on the right excuse me, shows the relative error from a, an altimetry-derived sea ice thickness product in the green, the green dots and a passive microwave-derived um, product in the blue. Uh, so basically, for thick ice, the relative error is small with altimetry. For thin ice, it's relatively small with the passive microwave. So using these two data sets together, you can get a much better look at the full ice thickness distribution. Um, in the Arctic. Um, and this is kind of the, the type of result that we get. This is a monthly map of sea ice thickness from, uh, from Cryosat, which is, which is an altimetry satellite. Um, we get this distribution of sea ice with thick ice across Greenland and Canada, driven by uh, wind, the wind-driven convergence. Um, 
And the, the, the slide on the right just shows how thickness has changed over the decades. So the time series um, in the 2000s is from satellites, so ISAT and Cryosat 2. And the, the kind of shaded time series are from uh, submarines, uh, again, Cold War submarines. Um, and basically, the Arctic sea ice is uh, thinned by half in, in that time period. Just a plug for ISAT 2, uh, this is kind of contradictory to what I said before. This is giving us um, tens of meter scale observations of ice and ocean topography in the polar oceans. And it, it was launched in September last year, and I think it's really going to uh, bridge the gap in, in terms of those small scale observations to the basin scale observations. It's a really fantastic instrument to look out for results coming out of that. Um, so looking at it from the ocean perspective now, rather than the, the sea ice. Um, so altimeters, as you probably all know, are really great at measuring sea level in the open ocean. Um, you get pitch, pitches that look like this, where the sea ice area is uh, not filled in. It turns out that doing a bit of kind of specialized uh, nerdy processing, you can look at sea level at the cracks in the sea, sea ice and uh, get an estimate of sea level in the ice covered portions of the ocean. There's that Beaufort gyre that Jamie was talking about. And when you stitch these uh, data products together, you can get a basin wide picture of, of sea level uh, in the Arctic. Um, this is great because it, it represents a, a column, uh, you know, a column averaged um, bulk measurement of the ocean column. And you can link it to things like freshwater sloshing around in the Arctic, um, as Jamie was alluding to in his talk. Um, it's also related to the circulation, so we can look at the currents. Um, both outside of the ice pack and underneath the ice pack. Again, there you see that both at Jaya transpolar drift uh, circulation. Uh, the other sea level tool that we have is GRACE. So GRACE, essentially since 2002, it's been weighing the ocean globally. So as well as being able to say how much ice is being dumped into the ocean from the ice sheet, it can look at how the wind is, wind, wind's been redistributing that water around the, around the ocean. and um, so you can look at modes of variability in the Arctic Ocean, barotropic uh, variability. Uh, that's just kind of illustrated on this, this plot on the right. So sea surface salinity, this is uh, Tony's uh, speciality, really. Um, it's an important parameter, because, in, especially in the Arctic, where it's cold, it really drives ocean density variations. Um, and obviously, gradients in the density drive circulation and mixing. And also, importantly, it maintains that stratification in the Arctic that um, Jamie was talking about with this uh, low density water, cold, fresh water lying on top of that warmer Atlantic water that could melt the ice many times over if it got to the surface. Um, it's also an important biogeochemical uh, variable. Um, so we can monitor this globally using L-band uh, passive microwave emissions. In the Arctic, there's higher uncertainty, basically because it's colder and because the instruments don't have the right bandwidth. Uh, there's also less in situ validation data, um, and future missions might address, address some of these issues. Sea surface temperature, this is actually a picture of skin temperature, so it's showing the sea surface temperature outside of the ice edge, and then this ice surface temperature inside the ice edge. Um, obviously, uh, sea surface temperature is important for heat, moisture, and momentum fluxes, that kind of thing. Um, and in the, in the Arctic in particular, we can monitor the intrusion of warm Atlantic water, warm Pacific water, and that river inflow that happens every year, um, and look at the effect that that has in the sea ice cover. This is a, an example I like from Son Yem's paper from 2012, where by June, this, so just to orient yourself in these maps, you're looking at northern Canada and uh, Alaska, and that's uh, Banks Island. All this open water uh, kind of opened up by mid-June in 2012. It was the record low sea ice year. And then once the Mackenzie River thawed, it dumped all of this heat into the Arctic Ocean, and that was picked up by MODIS. Um, and they were able to write a nice paper about how that affected the subsequent sea ice growth in the next season. A uh, quick word on upcoming missions. Uh, this is SWAT. It's going to be launched in 2021. It's a collaboration between JPL and the French and UK space agencies. It's an altimetry mission, but it's a SWAT altimetry mission, so it's going to give a two-dimensional picture of height. Uh, which will give us two-dimensional sea ice thickness and two-dimensional sea level and current um, uh, in, the, in the polar oceans as well. It's high latitude um, mission. NYSAR is another JPL mission in collaboration with the Indian Space Agency. It's also going to be launched in 2021. And this is a radar imager that's going to provide daily sea ice velocities and concentrations in, in the polar oceans. 
from our European partners, this is the European Commission Coper Copernicus program, which is actually not really like a science program, it's, it's a monitoring program. So it really aims to provide uh, operationally useful satellite data rather than just science data sets. So it's a continuing ongoing mission. This is a star imager called Sentinel-1 that they've launched two and they're gonna launch another two into the 2030s. And this provides more or less daily coverage of the Arctic Ocean for sea ice velocity and um, ice motion and ice type and that kind of thing. Similarly, the Sentinel-3 mission is ongoing uh, into the 2030s, and this is a radar altimeter that measures sea ice thickness, sea level, and current uh, in, in the same way that Cryosat and Icesat do. And this, again, this is going to provide continuity going forward. A couple of proposed missions uh, as part of the, the Copernicus uh, expansion program. SIMA is a particularly important one, I think, because uh, the Navy have stopped launching their SSMI images, uh, and the, all the ones that are up there now are the ones that we've got. And so there's a potential break in that ice concentration time series. There are uh, potential missions that can fill in the gaps, but until the Europeans launch this in probably 2025 plus, uh, we're going to be living on thin ice. Um, <laughs> uh, this is a passive microwave. And it's probably the most advanced passive microwave imager that's ever been, will be launched. Uh, it's gonna be, it should be able to give us all of these different um, important uh, parameters in the Arctic. Uh, and so if anyone ever asks, anyone in this room, should we launch SIMA? You say, yes, definitely launch SIMA. Um, another one that I'm interested in is Crystal. It's a, it's a cryosat type follow-on mission um, that will provide sea ice thickness, snow depth, and sea level in, in the polar ocean. Um, Tony uh, asked me to talk about uh, limitations uh, in, the poten in the current uh, kind of fleet that we have. Um, aside from that potential break in the passive microwave record, which is important for things like sea surface temperature, and ice concentration, ice motion. There's other things like ice thickness measurements are still too uncertain for most people's liking. We need to know more about the snow depth on sea ice if we want to say more about uh, sea ice thickness. Uh, sea level, we have good coverage right now, but IceSat2 and Cryosat2, they give coverage to 88 North, uh, and they uh, will be gone probably by the middle of next decade. Um, and again, with the sea surface salinity, that technique really is in its infancy in the polar oceans and is limited by this uh, lack of sensitivity at low temperatures. Um, just to conclude then, um, I would say that Earth, obs Earth observing satellites provide a huge value added for Arctic science because of all the reasons that I listed. Um, they're really essential for our large scale understanding of the Arctic system from an observational point of view, uh, and, but also highly complementary to all of the other data sets that we have. Um, obviously, we have regular base and scale observations of all these important climate variables going back to sometimes the 70s. Um, and whilst I, I highlighted some of those gaps and limitations that we currently have, I think that the system that we have now and going forward is pretty good. Uh, it's better than it's ever been, and it's getting better with the launch of these new NASA missions and the continuation of the EC Copernicus program. Um, but it also takes people to uh, use the data, and in particular, the, the Copernicus data, I would say, uh, is really great for delivering geophysical data for modeling. Uh, type studies, assimilation studies, and that kind of thing. Um, and they do deliver Arctic data. Um, so I'll just finish there. Thanks. So, Tom, in your sea ice thickness plot, uh, sea ice thickness uh, from radar as well as radiometry yeah. plot, that I just want to point out that uh, for there seasonal ice between about half a meter to a meter, there's still a very large uncertainty, even with a combination, yeah, even with a combination of radar, the curve on the right hand side, and the radiometry on the left hand side. And so from 50 centimeter to about one meter, the uncertainty is on average almost 50%, which is unacceptable for any initializing any CI forecast uh, models as well as for science. So I would say that there is a gap there that needs uh, improving technology uh, to, to fill that gap. And the radiometry on the left hand side is a very narrow band, L band radiometry. So I think the broadband radiometry or multi band low frequency radiometry could potentially help fill that gap, both for salinity and sea ice thickness. That will improve uh, ocean ice modeling and the sea ice forecast. So, yeah. Right, and that, that I understand is something that's being considered for SIMA. Okay, if you have uh, more questions, we will uh, continue after the. Uh, Two more presentation. Thank you, Tom.
So we move on to uh, talk by Amy Solomon uh, from University of Colorado as well as NOAA, uh, ESRL, and Amy is also the co-chair of the International Clivar Northern Ocean Regional Panel. So she's going to provide an update on that as well as the Mosaic campaign, the International Polar Trip Program. Thank yes. you, Amy. Thank you. So uh, this is just going to be a brief update of the Northern Oceans Region Panel, or NORP. Uh, and then I'm going to say a little bit about the Mosaic campaign. It's an upcoming campaign that is going to be playing a really important role in this panel in the next couple of years. So um, NORP is part of the World Climate Research Program. It's the newest panel. Uh, it's an international forum for the coordination and strategy development for activities regarding the role of the Arctic Ocean in the context of the global climate system. And this panel is working to facilitate progress in developing new tools and methods to observe the Arctic Ocean and neighboring seas and their climate impacts, and also to standardize and archive observations of the Arctic Ocean and the coupling with other components of the climate system. And the way we've organized this panel was we have seven uh, different task teams, uh, and we have 14 panel members, so there are three to four panel members in each of these task teams to facilitate cross-task team interactions. And these uh, task teams are the changing Arctic Ocean, development of a state-of-the-art Arctic Ocean reanalysis, the role of the Arctic Ocean in Arctic amplification, advancing the understanding of climate variability due to Arctic mid-latitude linkages, quantifying the response to natural external forcing and internal variability in the Arctic Ocean, promoting studies to assess model errors in Arctic projections, and Greenland ice sheet ocean interactions. And I'm just going to say a little bit um, more about the first three task teams because it's very important in terms of this Arctic observing system that we're talking about. And so task team one is focused on the changing Arctic Ocean. And this task team is focused on identifying gaps in our present day knowledge and understanding of the Arctic Ocean. It's also focused on understanding how processes are changing in the new Arctic and how that's impacting processes such as ocean turbulent mixing and how that affects the evolution of SST and sea ice. And it's also focusing on how uh, the exchange of energy and momentum between the Arctic Ocean and other components of the Earth system are changing in the new Arctic. For example, we have this increased amount of freshwater runoff off, off the ice sheet, and how is that affecting the dynamics of the Arctic Ocean? The second task team is improving our, our estimates of the Arctic Ocean sea ice state estimates, and this is from a a relatively recent paper on Arctic Ocean reanalysis intercomparison uh, from 2017. And what this is showing is Arctic snow volume as a function of months. And so the colored lines here are showing the individual reanalyses. Uh, and the dash black line is our, mo our most complete observational estimate. And it's really important to note that the very few observational observations go into this estimate. Uh, but the black solid line is showing the ensemble mean, and the vertical bars are showing plus and minus one standard deviation. And so the first thing to note is that there is a huge spread in what the um, reanalyses are showing for the snow volume. The second is that except for one month, uh, the ensemble mean is outside the range of the uh, climatology. And so this is really, this is critically important because snow on sea ice is an insulator, and it also has very different albedo characteristics from sea ice. So it really determines how much radiation reaches the sea ice in the ocean below. And this is just showing that the reanalyses that we use to validate the climate models are not well constrained. So we really need more observations of snow on sea ice to be able to constrain these reanalyses. The third is the role of the Arctic Ocean in Arctic amplification. And so this, is, uh, this task team is addressing some very interesting questions, uh, one of which is, do we have adequate measurements to evaluate the role of the Arctic, subarctic ocean in Arctic amplification? And what, are me what measurements are needed to evaluate this variability in climate models? So this is really an excellent opportunity for the panel to facilitate how best to use remote sensing and in situ measurements to evaluate climate models. So um, one campaign that's coming up, actually next month in September, it's called MOSAIC. So that stands for the Multidisciplinary Observatory for the Study of Arctic Climate. Um, and it's going to be, it's a year-round campaign. So it starts in the fall of 2019 and ends in the fall of 2020. 
Uh, it's centered on an icebreaker, a German icebreaker from Avi called the Polar Stern. It will be docked at the edge of the multi-year ice in a region close to where this red dot is showing. Uh, and then there will be a distributed network of satellite stations around the icebreaker, and that will be extending the observations from just the central location to uh, about 50 kilometers. So, um, no one says that. so the icebreaker will then drift uh, from the uh, East Siberian Sea with the ice pack through the Fram Strait. So uh, there, every two to three months, there'll be a resupply of crew and fuel and other equipment from um, different regions using icebreakers from Russia and from China. There'll be aircraft. Uh, there'll also be icebreakers from Sweden. So there, if this is a real international effort. There are 17 nations involved with this campaign. But these resupply lines, will, there'll also be measurements taken along the resupply lines, which will extend the spatial extent of the observations beyond the synoptic scale. There will also be these coordinated research aircraft campaigns, which will be extending uh, the observations in the vertical and also geographically. So it's been this air, uh, campaign is focused to get consistent measurements of the full coupled system. So from ocean variability and its interactions with the sea ice, to drift of the sea ice, its deformation and melting, to energy and momentum fluxes from the ocean through the ice to the atmosphere, to um, changes in cloud cover, its interactions with aerosols and how it affects the boundary layer. So the focus is getting consistent measurements of the coupled ocean ice atmosphere system. Uh, the second really important point is that this is a multi-scale design. As I said, there's, it's centered on an icebreaker and there are measurements that have to be on the icebreaker, such as cloud radar, that need to be maintained constantly. But the spatial extent of those observations is only about five kilometers. And so this distributed network around the icebreaker, which will have flex stations and ocean measurements and gliders, there'll be UAVs, will extend the observations to about 50 kilometers. So we like to think of this as a drifting climate model grid box. So we're actually going to be able to get observations in the middle of winter in the central Arctic on the order of a climate model grid box. Also, what's really important is there'll be measurements over the full annual cycle. So this is from a Pith and Marotson paper, 2014. Uh, the left figure is showing the processes that contribute to the annual warming, where the vertical axis is showing the magnitude of the Arctic warming. The horizontal axis is showing the magnitude of the tropical warming. So this gray dashed line in the middle, if it's below the gray dashed line, it's contributing to tropical amplification. If it's above the gray dash line, it's contributing to Arctic amplification. And this is showing that the lapse rate feedback and the albedo feedback are the dominant feedback for Arctic amplification. But if you look on the right, this is showing seasonal warming in the Arctic only. So winter warming in the vertical axis and summer warming in the horizontal axis. This is showing that the lapse rate feedback is contributing to warming in the winter and the albedo feedback is contributing to the warming in the summer. So we can't just take measurements in the summer and understand the processes that are contributing to Arctic amplification because all of the models are simulating all of these processes differently. And what's also really important is this is the interaction across the seasonal cycle. So changes in the albedo feedback and the amount of radiation that goes into the ocean is released into the atmosphere through the sea ice in winter and affecting the lapse rate feedback. So this is really the first time we will have these consistent measurements of the fully coupled system over a full grid box scale, over a full annual cycle. So uh, NORP is, um, it just started last year. We had our first face-to-face -face meeting last year. Uh, and this is one of the um, activities that we've been involved with. It was a pre-AGU workshop on uh, Greenland freshwater fluxes. It was very successful. And we have a number of interesting activities coming up this year. Uh, we're organizing a workshop on the role of freshwater in polar ocean climate change and global linkages. Um, and based on what Jamie was saying, this is critically important for understanding uh, the climate in the Arctic. Uh, we're also discussing leading an assessment of the CMIP freshwater and heat fluxes in the Arctic Ocean. Uh, we really want to work with the national representatives to secure port support to improve our Arctic Ocean reanalyses. Um, and another really important uh, activity I wanted to point out is we're talking about having a, a summer boot camp, a summer school boot camp. 
and this would be focused on taking observations from Mosaic and then uh, using it to educate uh, postdocs and graduate students about the Arctic Ocean system and processing the data for uh, evaluation with model studies. So thank you very much. Good question for, thank you, Amy. Good question for Amy. So with respect to NORP as well as Mosaic, um, NORP, I saw all the questions, but one component I didn't see, and I was curious if it's as part of that, anything regarding biogeochemistry as well as Mosaic. I did see BGC listed, but I was sort of curious like what you're doing for Mosaic and if there's any component actually in NORP. There isn't an, a component in NORP right now. But it will be a part of the um, workshop we're planning on the role of fresh water in the Arctic Ocean. So that will be a, a very important component. It's a very important component in Mosaic, both BGC and uh, ecosystem modeling. Uh, it's not something I'm involved with, and it's not something NORP is involved with, but it's a very important part of Mosaic. I can uh, quickly add to that. There is a report coming out of this, the Greenland Freshwater Workshop, and the, that has been actually identified as an important gap been identified that actually also participants were missing to speak to that part, but that's been a very important part to look at nutrients, um, transport, nutrient supply from the Greenland ice sheet into its margins and its relevance on ecosystems. So it's been specifically identified. Yeah, I just want to add a little more information that I uh, received from my uh, Arctic Science uh, Session colleagues. I was told that the initial motivation for the Mosaic campaign uh, is to have more observations of ocean atmosphere and sea ice to improve climate modeling in Arctic region. But later on, because uh, it's such a unique opportunity, then other community like biogeochemistry, they want to add more measurements to use this unique opportunity. Yes, yeah. I had two, I guess, two parts of question. One, like how much is the engagement with the YOP activity um, with Mosaic? And the second, in terms of data assimilation, is there engagement with data assimilators on all components, sea ice, ocean, and atmosphere to get a fully consistent reanalysis? Um, in terms of YOP, um, Mosaic is considered to be a part of YOP. And even though YOP is the year of polar prediction, uh, Mosaic will be in the third year of YOP. And so there are special observing periods. There have been two so far for YOP. Uh, one was in win last winter and uh, the summer before, and there's going to be a third special observing period during Mosaic. Um, there has been a discussion about having all of Mosaic as a special observing period, but that's not really realistic because one of the points of the YOP is um, to it have uh, additional Raywin songs released and it, people just don't have the money to do that. So they're still discussing exactly when uh, that special observing period will happen during Mosaic. But there's also other things, there's a YOP site MIP, they call it, um, where they have this intercomparison where the model, the um, forecast systems are outputting very high resolution output for the fully coupled system um, during Mosaic. And so there's going, so I'm, I'm actually one of the organizers of that. And we're going to be doing intercomparisons after every leg of Mosaic. So when the data is taken off the ship and it's on land, there'll be intercomparisons across the different forecast systems. And there are other things as well. Uh, but for data simulation, there really hasn't been that uh, good, there hasn't been good coordination with the data simulation at this point. I see some, uh, the goal is to understand internal variability and anthropogenic hawking. I just wonder uh, uh, how to use one year data to improve that. Uh, well, that's why I didn't include that in my, when I talked about the different task teams. It's not as related to Mosaic as other things. And so um, that'll be more like the paleoclimate data and um, comparing the, the different climate model simulations. Mosaic will not be as relevant for that task team. Okay, thank you, Amy. So we move on to the last uh, presentation by Patrick Heimbach, uh, who is an expert in ocean sea estimation, ocean ice sea estimation. And he's also a uh, member of the Quick, uh, North panel. <clears throat> thank you, to Tony, and thank you to the SSG for inviting me to uh, to uh, present at this meeting. Um, yeah, talk I put in uh, put together with a number of different directions that this this could go. So I added removed stuff. So I 
can't remember now what uh, what's actually remained in the talk. So we'll see. Um, this is there, no, there is okay. So um, oh, thank you. Um, I have to give credit to a number of people, mainly especially to Anne Guyen, who is uh, also at the University of Texas uh, at Austin. So. I always remind people uh, of uh, why it is that we do state and parameter estimation or, or why we're performing reanalysis. And it's, uh, it's as true, especially true in the Arctic, that we are faced with an eclectic observing system. We have uh, heterogeneous data streams. Um, we have uh, disparate variables or uh, it's a multivariate system that were being sampled at different time and space scales. Um, so non-uniform, and so the question remains is uh, how do we sort of best synthesize these different types of observations um, into a coherent dynamical framework, and uh, sort of the, that's the major goal of data assimilation, namely to make optimal use of the information that's, or extracting the, all the information that's contained uh, in these different observations, these different variables at their and also the physical laws that we know and that are expressed uh, in the models. And also taking into account these prior uncertainties that we have and the, the uncertainties that we have in the data of the different types. So with, with that, um, I'd like to uh, first uh, go back to also the uh, effort that uh, Amy already mentioned. This is uh, the, this ORA IP is the Ocean Reanalysis Intercomparison Project. I have to stress that this is actually global data assimilation models. So these have been running for 50 years. And um, there has been several efforts now to actually evaluate, validate these global efforts uh, with a focus on the Arctic. And there's many other FOSI. There's one on uh, the AMOC. There's one on the Tropical Pacific. But this one is the first one to assess uh, sea ice cover in the Arctic. And then there's been a second one. Um, so this is by Chevalier Dow 2016. Uh, more recently, the ocean reanalysis for, by Utsi um to 2018, uh, from which uh, you've seen a figure uh, about the, this, this, the large spread of, for example, snow ice cover that is in these uh, reanalysis products. Um, so it's, it's really hard to, to go into details of what these show, but um, um, clearly what they, they caution, they said, look, this is a, is a very first effort to actually um, in a moving target, something a field that's rapidly evolving, um, and um, but the, despite that, you know these type of models there remain with us for a while. So some of these issues uh, are bound to uh, to maybe per, um, persist for for the time being. Um, another important uh, aspect is here model diagnostics. This is a topic that also came up in other ocean. Uh, it's been by the Cliver panel, ocean model development, and in support for CMIP six that more um, model diagnostics is needed in, for example, to uh, to uh, form accurate uh, uh, model diagnostics, transport, uh, uh, convergence, divergences, and so on. And um, common metrics uh, that um, across several, several communities, for example, the climate modeling communities and the reanalysis community. It's an issue that also has been uh, persistent, for example, in the AMOC community where there's actually now an effort to actually try to, to merge those. So, um, so this is just a, a very broad um, sort of other type of summary of these global efforts with the, that's been focusing on the Arctic. But what I'd like to, um, to, uh, to stress now is on regional efforts. And there are actually very few efforts so far that are really targeting the sort of a regional Arctic Ocean uh, sea ice reanalysis or state estimate, something comparable to, for example, the Southern Ocean state estimate. So in the following, I will be presenting um, the, and, or introducing the sort of what might be called the NOCI, the Northern Ocean state estimate, but we called it in a different way, which is called it the Arctic Subpolar North Atlantic state estimate. It's uh, an effort uh, that's been funded by NSF, but also with, um, with uh, you know, um, leveraging of, um, of uh, capabilities that's been developed uh, within ECHO and uh, using the ECHO framework. So the Arctic Ocean State Estimate, it's, a, it's an adjoint base, so it's some people might call a 40 bar state estimate. Period is here, it's a compromise, it's 2002 to 2017. Compromise, not going further back in time because of observational lack, 2002, basically the beginning of when we start to have grace, we have ISAT in the subpolar or in the North Atlantic, uh, we begin to ramp up uh, Argo observations. So a good compromise where we actually can really feel comfortable that observations are beginning to actually constrain uh, a model. 
And the output of that is uh, yeah, in the time varying ocean and sea ice states. Uh, we we in deliberately included the North Atlantic in order to capture exchange processes between the North Atlantic and the Arctic. Um, initial conditions um, are from uh, yeah, some certain um, climatologies that we have. Forcing here, um, forcing priors are is the JRA 55 product. Um, it's another issue of, uh, especially if you do uncoupled force simulations, uh, both our group here, groups in Europe, uh, have been finding the, 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 the problem with the uh, atmospheric reanalysis. They are especially poorly constrained and have large biases in the Arctic that have huge implications for, for uh, forcing ocean models. So a big problem here. Um, open boundary conditions for this regional estimates come from the echo uh, estimating the circulation climate of the ocean version for the global state estimate. Um, just to um, give you some ideas on the data constraints. Um, so we have, we, dis we distinguish this between the low latitude sort of here in the, in the North Atlantic and then specific high latitude uh, data. In the low latitude, these are what we might call sort of standard observations in CT observations that we've also used in the global state estimate. But then here in high latitude, sort of specialized data like the uh, ITP data, the, uh, the before gyre experiment uh, program, and then uh, NABOS uh, data. And you see them here stratified in color by Argo data, low latitude CTD, high latitude ITP moorings. And again, what stands out here in terms of observational lead, again, you see here the most of the Siberian shelf being completely non sampled at all or under sampled, um, and then sort of uh, areas that are thin, of course, ITP data in regions where you can actually tether them on sea ice, but that, that are also that, that area is uh, somewhat limited. And this is all the data that we have if we remove them, these uh, blue here CTD data, uh, if we, if we um, stratify them by time, um, then this would start to begin uh, to look uh, quite uh, thin. So we uh, then, so this just as an example of cost function reductions of the different observational types. If you go through the assimilation process um, that I don't go into, um, I haven't actually have probably removed the slide on uh, uh, sea ice uh, constraints, especially from uh, from satellite data. So, um, but uh, we had a very nice presentation on this. Just an example to um, show what kind of um, what what what's that issue here? We need to uh, resolve sort of the this the stratification here in the Arctic, um, so here in temperature, we have this in um, orange, the, this is what we call ASTID, the polar hydrographic um, climate and the World Ocean Atlas for a specific um, ITP pro profile to show some of the issue of persistent biases that we have in these climatologies. And then once we go into all the data sets, then we have this here's the 50% uh, percentile of, um, of misfits um, from ASTI and uh, versus uh, some of these other data as compared to, uh, to, uh, to ice tethered uh, profilers. We can look at this in different ways. So this is the from straight transport that we use as a constraint. Uh, we have in gray here, for example, the, the thick gray here, uh, observation at 250 meter depth in from straight, uh, the optimized version versus the free running non-optimized version here. The color coding on the left here gives you an impression of the, this is the Fram Strait, uh, the western part of the Fram Strait, so where, yes, you have the East Greenland curtain coming down, and then here the eastern side where you have the warm water coming in through the West uh, Spitsbergen current, and this is stratified here in terms of the cost function reduction. And you see, um, and especially on the eastern side, we are able to nicely reduce the, these, um, the, the, the misfit to the observations, but we're actually increasing it here on the eastern side. So what I'm just showing here, I don't want to, uh, not all is great. So this is, a, this is a tough problem. And this has to do with the recirculation of Arctic water inflow and its representation in models of, of the certain types of resolution. So just to show you all the, the different things that, uh, that we are assessing can be assessed, the things that can go wrong if you try to fit one type of data at the expense of um, basically getting a poor fit to, to other uh, types of data. So this uh, uh, Arctic state estimate, it's about, uh, we've been kind of by this uh, invitation being um, sort of call, uh, caught off guard here. It's about to be released uh, here at the Texas Advanced Computing Center um, at, a, at the data portal. Um, 
not there yet, but I, I think it's going to be there within the month for the community to, uh, to, um, to have available. And of course, the long-term plan or the, in, in the coming year is to work with the NSF uh, Arctic Data Center to provide the, the corresponding metadata information. But I've been asked about needs and um, uh, modeling needs, there are of course various ones, uh, in spe specifically on, uh, on sea ice modeling, ice dynamics and thermodynamics. Resolution, we know the Rossby radius deformation in the Arctic is particularly small, so high resolution is really important. The maintenance or the evolution of the Arctic halo climb, uh, what, um, at, um, um, where I was talked about earlier, uh, the mixing and especially the, the very the, the mixing in the in the central Arctic has been much uh, vertical mixing much lower than in other parts of the ocean. And the question becomes whether with an increasingly ice free ocean and an increased uh, uh, momentum input, um, you this mixing uh, uh, might change. And one that I've highlighted also is for force simulations, the just the atmosphere uh, and the implied uh, air sea fluxes play a huge role in in throwing these uh, ocean sea ice models uh, off. Um, so that's an, that's an important part to keep in mind. Model output, I've, uh, I've mentioned this and, and model metrics. Uh, also um, highlighted here, the Arctic, the Siberian shelf. The, what we find is that um, uh, simulating the inflow of water masses, especially um, you know, the, the um, Atlantic water inflow, and how that is simulated might throw everything downstream off, right? If you don't get the inflow of these water masses right, then um, there is you, you're just redistributing the wrong type of water masses in the in the Arctic interior. And uh, Sandy Starkweather has nicely showed about this sort of the virtual lack of any observations in the in the in the Arctic interior in the deep Arctic. And the question is how, uh, for example, uh, Argo floats, Arctic Argo floats might actually help us and um, even the fact that larger uncertainties that you might incur by the inability of these floats to resurface for an extended period of time might still be such that you're, you're, you, you, you will get with a larger uncertainty, though still a useful uh, type of measurement. And then finally, um, the role of data assimilation and uncertainty quantification here, um, I think, and we'll talk about this tomorrow morning, is the, the use of um, sort of methods a quantitative methods for uh, observing system design. Um, and I, I'd like to give an example here. Um, let's see here, there's actually uh, not our group, but uh, so the, the idea of observing system design can be phrased in some framework if you know the sensitivity of a quantity of interest that you're after um, to all your uncertain parameters. And on the one hand side, sorry, this is, uh, sorry. Um, yeah. So you, you have a, a prior of your quantity of interest that's shown here, right? That prior uh, is given by this prior error covariance matrix and the sensitivity of the, your quantity of interest to your uncertain parameters. And then you have a posterior. And there's a lot of meat in this posterior because it takes into account the, the prior uncertainties of your uncertain parameters, the uncertainties in the observations, and the propagation of those uncertainties by a dynamical model. All of this is uh, encapsulated in this very, you know, this, this P. And the idea of, one idea of optimal experimental design is to basically say we can project those sensitivity, you know, how do the sensitivity of the quantity of interest project onto the sensitivity to your observations? Or you could reframe it that way, the information that's required to constrain your quantity of interest, project, how does that project onto the information that's transmitted by your observing system? And um, the study, this has been shown by a study by Kaminsky et al. in the cryosphere series 2015-2018, where they've been using uh, Operation Icebridge uh, flight lines. Um, they had to um, do some, uh, yeah, so them reduce, sort of reducing the dimensionality of this problem, but essentially looking at these flight lines uh, measurements and then looking at how these uh, different flight lines would, con uh, would uh, constrain or improve uh, the skill in, um, in uh, ice thickness and, uh, and snow thickness. And basically the idea is exactly that. You, so you have a sensitivity map of your observation um, um, operator and you have a sensitivity of your quantity of interest. And then basically when you project that, you basically get an error reduction. So these are in the different regions 
of your, um, uh, this is the ice, uh, the ice thickness, and then this, I think it's the snow thickness, and these bars shows for each of the different um, um, types of observational assets that you have, the reduction in uncertainty that these observational assets give you. I think that's it was way too fast, so I'm, uh, uh, but I just wanted to give you an impression of what can be done uh, with these tools, and I'd uh, finish and uh, take uh, questions. Oops, sorry. Uh, 